so hey, everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, today we have a general call by uh, Alison Brown uh, from uh, University of Milan Ricocca and uh, EPFL, talking about uh, localizing information and quantum gravity. So take it away. Great. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's very nice to be giving this talk. So my talk today is going to be based on two papers and some work that I've been doing over the last couple of months uh, with uh, some very nice collaborators, Ayo Abahiro, Kyriakos Papadodimats, Gabor Sarozi, and Nilupar Vardian. Um, and the, the main to topic that I'm going to talk about is locality in quantum gravity or, or deviations of locality in quantum gravity. Uh, and I should start by saying that my understanding is that some people that are in the audience today are thinking about this question, perhaps from a very different perspective, more from a scattering amplitudes slash bootstrap perspective. And it, it's very nice to, I think these approaches are somewhat complementary, And so it's very nice to, if we can all have a conversation. So I tried to make the talk very informal. So please interrupt me as much as you want and, and ask questions. Okay, so before diving into quantum gravity, which is, complicated, let me start by reviewing some things that are known about locality in, in, in quantum field theory. So locality, oh, was it not working? Hold on. There we go. Ah, there we go. My pen is, my pen is working, but not very well. Okay, so locality and causality are, are very powerful in quantum field theory. Um, so powerful that they enable us to completely localize information. I don't know why my pen is not working very well, but it is what it is in quantum field theory. So as you all know, operators at space-like separation commute. Yeah, my pen is not working very well. I'm sorry about that. I'll try to write as best as I can. Um, and that enables us to completely localize information in, in quantum field theory. So, so let's, see, let's just see how, how that works. So let's consider some Cauchy slice sigma. Um, split it up into, the, say, I don't know, two or three regions. Let's call this region D. Let's call this region D prime. Uh, and we would like to understand, is it possible uh, to localize information to change the state in D prime in such a way that we cannot detect it at all from all observables, all correlation functions in D. Okay, uh, and and the answer is yes, and it's yes because of this property here. Okay, and it's very easy. So since it's easy, let, let me just show you how it works. So let's start from some state. Psi could be the vacuum, could be an excited state. It doesn't matter too much, and we're going to go to another state called Psi prime, uh, where we just act uh, on the original state with some operator, Phi of Y, let's take Phi to be a Hermitian operator. Um, and, and Y is gonna be, say here, this is Y in region D prime, okay? So this is now a different state. We acted with an operator, it created an excitation in, in, in state Y, and because the operator Phi is Hermitian, this is a unitary. Okay, and now we can ask, can we detect uh, this excitation, the fact that we changed the state from correlation functions in D? And you'll see right away that the answer is no. So if, if we compute, I don't know, some correlation function, all of these observables, all of these operators are located in D, psi prime. And because the O's in D commute with phi of Y, because they're space-like separated, I can just invert the ordering here at no cost and bring this here. And then the two, the two unitaries uh, cancel. And this just gives us psi, oh, psi. Okay, so all, for all possible, this, this works for any number of operator insertion points O located anywhere in D, okay? So all correlation, functions in region D are completely unaffected uh, by the creation by the excitation that we created in region D prime. Okay. And again, this all worked crucially because operators at space-like separation commute. Okay. 
Okay. So in quantum field theory, we can completely localize information. We can create, create excitations somewhere that are completely undetectable from far away. Okay. Uh, and I should say that this also works if you have a gauge theory. If you have a gauge theory, it's a little bit more subtle because uh, if you create an excitation here uh, with a positive charge, um, well, you know, the positive charge creates some electric field and due to the Gauss law, if you're sitting far away, you can detect the fact that you created a particle with a positive charge. And that comes from the fact that a, a local operator of positive charge is not really a gauge invariant operator in a gauge theory. What you should do is, you know, create, put operators of positive and negative charge and then um, connect them with a Wilson line. Say something like this. This is a gauge invariant operator now. It's not really local. It's localized to some region, but it's not. it doesn't live at a point. Uh, but operators of this type are now completely indetectable from far away. And you could also act with local operators that are just made out of the gauge field, like you know trace F squared or something like that. And those are localized at a point. All of these observables are, are gauge invariants. And if you build a unitary out of them, completely impossible to detect from region D. OK, so even if you have a gauge theory, you can still completely localize information. Um, there's fancier way to, fancier ways to do all of this than, than what I'm talking about right now. There's things called split states where you completely unentangle the degrees of freedom in D and D prime. Um, and so correlation functions, they're completely factorized between the state on D and D prime and, and the same, same type of logic holds, okay? So in quantum field theory, we understand this very, very well. Uh, and it's clear that you can completely localize information. Now, before turning to quantum gravity, it's also interesting to consider the place of classical gravity. So the way we think about classical gravity, um, say, uh, in, in the Hamiltonian formalism, is that we talk about, again, Cauchy slices, and the degrees of freedom of classical gravity are the phase space variables, so the induced metric on the slice uh, and the extrinsic curvature on the slice, those label completely the degrees of freedom of classical gravity. Uh, and there's theorems that have been proven by very rigorous mathematicians, you know, people that are studying GR from a mathematical point of view that have proven that you can take, so for example, let's split space into D, which is the outside of some region, and D prime, which is the inside. Um, there exists infinitely many configurations um, in D prime that you can glue that you can glue exactly, and this is important, to Kerr in D. Okay? So the idea is that in region D, outside of some compactly supported region, the metric looks exactly like the Kerr metric, exactly. So there's no tail of anything, and it looks exactly like Kerr. Uh, and inside, you can glue infinitely many configurations onto it. Okay, one configuration would be just the Kerr metric all the way inside, but you can also have collapsing shells of various kinds, and there's infinitely many base space degrees of freedom that you can glue onto this. Okay, but if you only have access to region D. Uh, you would not be able to tell the difference. You're sitting in region D, the metric is exactly the Kerr metric, okay, up to different morphisms. Okay, uh, so that shows you again that you can localize information in classical gravity, um, because if you're sitting in D, how do you know which of the infinitely many configurations you're in? You simply cannot tell, okay? Of course, in gravity, things are a little bit more subtle than what we talked about before, because in classical gravity, the Hamiltonian is a boundary term. The, the, the ADM Hamiltonian is a boundary term. And so, for example, if you take, I don't know, flat space and you add a little bit of excitations, you add some gravitons, they have some energy and you can immediately read it off from infinity. Okay? So you have to do a little bit of work to localize information. That's what, maybe one of the reasons why people worked hard to prove these theorems. Um, so you can't just take flat space and add a little bit of wiggles because generically that will create energy. And you see, unlike in unlike in 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 ENM, we don't have negative charge to screen it. Okay, so as soon as you add a little bit of energy, you can detect it from far away. But the idea is here is that you know the 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 energy at infinity is fixed; it's the Kerr mass, 
Um, but there's infinitely many configurations that have the same asymptotic energy. Okay, you just reshuffle the degrees of freedom in many ways. Okay. Uh, so basically, uh, so we, we can localize information in quantum. Sorry, sorry. Yes, uh, question. Uh, there's a question. Yeah. So in this define the configurations are not uh, distinguishable from the multiple expansion. They all have the same expansion such that we take care. I did not. Can you repeat the question? It's a. It's whether whether we cannot read off d prime from the multiple expansion. Uh, if they have different multiple expansion, do they all have the same multiple expansion such that it it, it matches curve? Right. If you yeah, do yeah. It, yeah. If you sit here and you do a multiple expansion, you will see exactly the same multiple expansion as you see in curve. So the metric here is exactly curve. And you, you, you might ask, how is it possible? Because you know, if you start rearranging the matter fields in very complicated ways, you might think that that will change the multiple expansion far away, right? But the point is that here, you're, here what you're doing, uh, typically, if you try to do this, uh, you'll have tails of the distribution that extend out to infinity. Here, the idea is that you're changing the phase space variables in a compact support. Okay, in, in, a, in a way that's compactly supported. Um, so that does not change the multiple expansion far away. What, what was the answer clear? Well, yes. Yeah, yeah, it's, I think it's good, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, but this is an important point is that uh, to do this, you have to sort of, you know, change the, you have to change the phase, the phase space degree, degrees of freedom that we have here. You have to change them in a way that's compactly supported, okay? And that's like, that's a non-analytic change of the phase space variables. It's something that you're allowed to do in GR, um, but, but you, have to, you have to keep that in mind. And if you just, you know, if you just try to add wiggles in some random way, usually that's not compactly supported, right? That extends out to infinity and you can read it off from the multiple expansion. But here we're really changing things in a way that's compactly supported. So th this cannot be read off from infinity. Very good. Um, so as I was saying in, in, in quantum field Alex, theory, th this, yes. this theorem is like specific for care metric. You cannot do it for any other. Uh, yeah, it's specific for the Kerr metric. Well, the theorem that I know of, um, which you can find the references of in 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 our paper, um, is specific to the Kerr metric. So you know, the Kerr metric still preserves some symmetry. So it's sort of nicer. Uh, I don't know if a theorem has been proven for the most general solution of Einstein's equation, which breaks all the symmetries. I would assume that it's true also there, but I'm not aware of a theorem. So yeah. Then let me make a provocative question. If I count all the configurations that do not change the most, so that the match curve, if I manage to be able to count them, do, do I get the Hawking interview? Ah, uh, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a very good question. Um, so the, the short answer is, is no, because here the number of such configuration is infinity. Um, so really what you would need to do is probably, I, I think this is something that I've thought about. I've never managed to make good progress. Um, what you would need to do probably is, is discretize phase space into Planckian size cells and then try to count those in some way, take into account the fact that different phase space configurations are probably not exactly orthogonal in the quantum theory. Actually, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and then try to somehow get the, the Hawking entropy from that. Uh, but doing it this way has not been done, at least to the best of my knowledge. I think the, the main difficulty comes from the fact, I mean, this, this is sort of orthogonal a bit to the talk, but the main di difficulty, difficulty comes from the fact that uh, classically, you can talk about two distinct configurations in phase space, uh, but in the quantum theory, those are not exactly orthogonal. There's an over-completeness of these states. Okay, these states, you should think about them as coherent states. So just like in, you know, when, you, when we talk about the simple harmonic oscillator, you can talk about coherent states and they're labeled by, you know, uh, an expectation value of X and an expectation value of P. They're quantum states, but they're as classically, um, they're as classical as possible. Uh, but coherent states are not 
orthogonal, right? There's there's the e to the minus one over h bar and some function of x and p. So the same thing here will happen in the quantum gravity theory. Different classical configurations become not exactly or not exactly orthogonal, and you need to take that into account. Presumably, if one did that correctly, one would get the Hawkinson the Bekenstein Hawking entropy from it, but that hasn't been done. It's an interesting question. Good. Um, yeah. So you'll please keep all these questions coming. I think this is great. Uh, this is this is how this is how I, I I meant to talk. So hopefully we can we can continue. Good. So in quantum field theory, you can localize information. In classical gravity, you can also localize information. Um, but somehow in quantum gravity. Um, this is completely destroyed, okay? This property is completely destroyed. Okay, um, in quantum gravity, there's no local degrees of freedom. Okay, uh, this is the essence, if you want, of holography. Uh, which says that all, all the degrees of freedom are located at the boundary, or in other words, if you have access to the boundary information, you know everything there is to know about what's happening in the bulk. Okay, so 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 boundary information completely specifies the bulk. Okay, uh, and so this is sort of a general statement if you believe holography generally for quantum gravity, but it's certainly how it works in the ADS CFT correspondence, where if I give you access to the CFT state, that's all there is to know. Then you can do whatever you want with the state, compute correlators on it, time evolve it, do whatever you want, but that's the full information, and there is no more than size CFT to know. That specifies everything you want to know. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, this is a bit of a formal statement because this is really true as a non-perturbative statement, okay? Okay, so th this is, if you want, this is true as a, as a finite G Newton slash H bar or finite N statement, okay? Uh, uh, but on the other hand, we know that as you take the classical limit, once you go to classical gravity, you can localize information, which is what I discussed on the, on the previous slide. Okay, so, so the question is, the, the fact that locality destroyed is the real question that we should be asking is, okay, in quantum gravity, locality is completely destroyed, but that's true non-perturbatively, okay? But we live in a universe where there is, you know, presumably we live in a world where there's quantum gravity, we do local physics all the time, right? So somehow there, there must be some notion of locality that is preserved. And, and the real question that we should be asking is, you know, is non-locality destroyed in perturbation theory or is it only destroyed non-perturbatively in G Newton? Okay. That's the real question. Sorry, locality is destroyed. So is locality destroyed in genuine perturbation theory or, or is locality destroyed only non-perturbatively? So that's the real question that, that we should be asking. Okay. Um, and and, and what, why is locality so tricky in quantum gravity? So to even talk about the question of locality, you need to come up with candidate local observables, local operators. Okay, that's how, you know, in quantum field theory, we talked about the operator phi of x, or if you have a gauge theory trace F squared, those are you know good local operators. They're gauge invariant and we can talk about them and then we can say what happens to them, what are the commutators like, okay? Um, 
But the problem is that once you're in, in, in gravity, uh, you need to specify what you mean by a local operator and your op whatever your operator is, it also needs to be gauge invariant or in other words, diffeomorphism invariant, okay? Uh, and that's very tricky because it sort of usually makes them um, non-local from the get-go. So one way to construct diff invariant operators, if your space-time has a boundary, then you can start from the boundary, which is a place where gravity is turned off. You know, you, you pick a point at the boundary and you say, okay, I'm going to shoot a geodesic into the bulk at a right angle, say, for some distance d, and I'm going to talk about the point there. Okay. So I don't know. So this is like d, this is a right angle, and then we, we talk about the point here and we put some operator here. Okay. So that's a, that's a diff invariant way to specify an operator. The problem is that it's not really local because you made use of the boundary to specify the location of the operator, okay? The technical way to say this is that this operator phi of x is gravitationally dressed to the boundary, okay? This is like a gravitational Wilson line. Okay, it's not so different from a from a usual gauge theory where you can also put a local operator with a charge and then ascend the Wilson line all the way to to infinity. And the fact that there you can detect the operator from infinity is because of the Gauss law. You can read off the total charge from infinity. And here there's something similar happening is that there's a gravitational Gauss law. Okay. And the fact that you specify the location of this operator by using the boundary means that when you compute the commutator of H, the Hamiltonian, with your operator phi, this will not be zero. Okay? Uh, and, and really it's order G Newton, which is the, the scale of back reaction, if you want. Okay? Uh, so, so this is sort of the problem is that in gravity to specify just the location of a point, you need to do that in a different variant way. And the most common way to do that is by using a boundary. Okay, we use a boundary where gravity is turned off, we throw some operator, we, we specify how to go inside and there we put an operator. Um, but the problem is that, that now, because we use the boundary to specify that point, the, the commutator between the Hamiltonian and the operator phi will not be zero. In particular, if you do a little bit of time evolution, you know, say now you do a little bit of time evolution on the boundary, okay? Well, the, the point where you start from will be here. And so you shoot inside at a right, right angle for the same distance. And now you see your bulk operator has been moved, okay? Um, and uh, the fact that it has been moved is encoded in the fact that, you know, the Hamiltonian, which generates time evolution and your operator phi do not commute. Okay? If you do a bit of time evolution on the boundary, it'll, it'll move the bulk points accordingly, okay? Um, and, and, and it's important to say that this is really, you see here, this is order G Newton. So this is a perturbative effect. Okay. Uh, so, 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 so this is a reason to worry that even in G Newton perturbation theory, because of the gravitational Gauss law, it's not gonna be possible to hide operators. See in gravity, there's no negative charge. So you cannot do this sort of you know, E plus, E minus pairs that we're talking about before, uh, you might worry that every time that you try to add an operator, you have to say where it is by making reference to the boundary. Uh, and so you will never be able to get an operator that commutes with the Hamiltonian outside, for example, okay? So you, it always, it, it'll always be detectable at that level. And, and again, this is a perturbative effect, okay? Now, there, there, there's more careful arguments that have so, been made by, by Suvrat Raju. There's a, there's a question? Uh, yeah, yeah. Is it important yeah. that the boundary is timeline or? Uh... Could, 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 could you hear? The, the, I, I heard the word time like, but I didn't hear the, the rest question, of the question. The question was uh, if it's important that the boundary is time like. Uh... For this argument, not terribly, no. If you had a null boundary, like in flat space, essentially the same argument would go, go through. Um, of course, we understand things better when the boundary is time-like, like in ADS CFT. Uh, but for this argument, no. The same argument can be made in flat space. All right, thanks.
Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, so I was saying Suvrat Raju and various of his collaborators in, in, in various papers uh, have, have even shown that you, they've constructed an algorithm. They did it both in ADS and in, in, and in Mikowski space, uh, an algorithm to sort of use this, this fact in the quantum theory uh, to show that you can reconstruct an operator deep inside flat space or deep inside ADS by acting just with operators near the boundary. Okay, um, so it, it's a it's a if you want it's a way to do this argument more formally and to, sh to show you that you have reasons to be worried in in, in genome perturbation theory. Okay, um, but what I want to do today is is actually actually argue for the opposite. So the goal for today is the following. I want to convince you that information uh, can still be localized to all orders in G Newton. Okay. Um, but there's a caveat only around sufficiently complicated states. And I'll say exactly what I mean by that. Okay, uh, so I will show you that even though th there's this worry of the gravitational Gauss law, uh, in fact, that's not that big of a deal. Okay, and it, it does look sort of problematic around the Minkowski vacuum or the ADS vacuum, but around other states, which you know, for most of the Hilbert space anyway, uh, there's actually not a problem. Okay. Um, very good. So, so the, the outline for the rest of the talk is the following. It's pretty simple. Um, so this was my introduction. I'm going to formulate this problem in ADS CFT. Okay, I'm going to introduce both local operators. And show you that they, they satisfy all the properties that you would want uh, of, of local operators. Okay, that, that they are really local to all orders in Newton perturbation theory. Um, and then I'm just going to discuss their interpretation. Okay, so the, the, the plan is pretty simple. Um, but before I move on, let me just see if there if there's any questions about this. I guess not. Very guess good. Very good. So let's get started. Oh, sorry, and I wanted to say one more thing about classical gravity. Uh, so in classical gravity, you can um you can talk about observables, you know, you can measure, you know, scalar quantities like the Ricci scalar or, or, you know, contractions of the Riemann tensor. Those are classical observables. And you can talk about their Poisson bracket as in the sense of classical mechanics. Uh, and, and it was showed many years ago by DeWitt that you can actually define local observables in, in classical gravity. The way that you do this is the following way. So, so, so if you're if you have D, sorry, I called the region D. This is annoying. Uh, so let me let me use ADS CFD terminology. So you take D plus one scalar quantities. So no, you can take like R, R mu nu, R mu nu, Riemann squared contracted into scalar. You you make D plus one scalar quantities. Okay. Um, and then you say, okay, I want to look for a point where R equals four, R mu nu, R mu nu equals six, uh, you know, Riemann squared equals uh, four or whatever. Uh, and you specify, you specify the value of these scalar quantities, these D plus one scalar quantities. So this is the, the number of bulk space-time dimensions. Uh, and then you act, then you say that defines my classical observable. 
And in general, if you have a complicated metric, uh, this will either click at no space time point or it'll click exactly at one space time point. Okay, there will be one point in space time where these quantities take the value that you want. And then you, def you define the observable by measuring some other function, again, some other scalar function defined at that point. And then what DeWitt showed is that if you do it this way, uh, if you look at the Poisson bracket or the more, the, the more covariant uh, version of it called the Pyros bracket of two of these observables at space-like separation, then they commute, okay? So this is the equivalent, the, the, the classical gravity equivalent of operators at, at space-like separation commuting, okay? But it's very important that uh, you're in a, if you're in a generic state, this has a chance of working because these scalar quantities, they will only take a particular value at a given point. If you're in flat space or you know, R and R mu nu and all of these things are zero everywhere, right? So you, you either click at no points or you click at every single point of the space time. Same, same in ADS, you know, R, R mu nu, R mu nu, R, Riemann squared, everything is, is related by a single number, which is the cosmological constant. So you will click nowhere or you, you'll click everywhere, okay? And so in maximally symmetric spaces, this procedure by the width does not work, okay? Uh, and what I'll talk about today in the quantum theory will be sort of equivalent. It'll only work around sufficiently complicated states that break the symmetries, but it will not work around the ADS vacuum, okay? And I really think that that's a feature of the state, not a feature of quantum gravity, but I'll get back to that. Okay, sorry for this detour. I should have said that earlier when talking about classical gravity, okay? So that's just to tell you that not only can you localize information in classical gravity, but you can also talk about local observables uh, in, in, the, in the sense that we're used to in classical mechanics and, and, you know, and, their, and their Poisson bracket and so on and so forth. Okay, anyway, sorry for that aside. And let me get started and, and talk about the problem in ADS-CFT or, or the setup in ADS-CFT. Okay. So we're going to imagine that we have a holographic CFT, like n equals to four super males that's strong coupling. Uh, we put it on uh, the cylinder. So we put it on the sphere times time. Here's a picture of that. Okay. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to define a narrow time band. Okay, of size two epsilon, say, okay? So this is the time band. Uh, and then we're gonna define this curly A, which is gonna be the algebra of single trace operators. That live in this time band. So it's an algebra, so you can take products of the single trace operators together, you'll generate multi trace operators and so on and so forth. Uh, so you think about all the single trace operators that you can act with in this narrow time band. Okay, so this time band is like T is in minus epsilon epsilon. Okay, and all points of the sphere. Okay. And now we can formulate the question. Can we find an operator O, okay, such that O commutes with A um, up to exponentially small corrections. So this means to all orders in the one over N expansion, okay, for all A in the time band algebra. Okay, so we're trying to find an operator that commutes with all single trace operators inserted in this time band. Okay, and, and this to accuracy eats the minus n squared. Okay. Uh, and at the same time, and then it's important that we also ask the second. So this is the first condition that we wanna ask. And the second one is that O acts like an HKL operator. And I'll, I'll review that in a second. To leading order at large n. So the HKL construction is the sort of standard way that we construct local operators in the bulk in ADS-CFT. I'm going to review it in two minutes, but I just want to talk about the interpretation. So say, say for a second that we could find an operator 
that satisfied this property, what is going to be the interpretation of this operator? Is that so in the bulk, we can extend now this little time band into the bulk using light cones. Okay. So it's going to give us a very thin region extended into the bulk. And there's going to be a complementary region in the bulk that's that's space like separated from, from, from this, this region here. So there's going to be some diamond that looks like this. Okay. And all points in this diamonds are space like separated from, from the time bounds. Okay. Okay, so if we can construct an operator with the two properties that I specified here, the interpretation is that it's going to correspond to a local bulk operator uh, that 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 lives in here. Okay. Uh, uh, yes. Question. Yeah, uh, the, the, uh, it was just um, the the yellow is uh, a bit hard to to see at least on the screen. If if you if you could use. Oh, sorry. What was hard to see? The, the the writing uh it's um oh the writing is, sorry uh it uh, it blends a bit into the background so if you could use a different color that would be oh then then green yeah. sorry green is not good oh that's green it appears yellow on uh, on our projector <laughs> might be a yeah, te technical issue let me try this how about this is this better yeah yeah that, that's much better thanks yeah okay sorry about that. Okay, so there's some region in the bulk that is space like separated from the time band that we defined. Okay, and the interpretation of this operator O, say we can find it and we, we hope that there's many, the interpretation is that it's going to correspond to local bulk fields inserted in this complementary diamond, okay, that is space like separated from A. Okay. Uh, note that this, this gravitational Gauss law that we're going to see in a second uh, is still here as a, prob as a potentially problematic thing, right? Because the Hamiltonian, the CFT Hamiltonian is included. So the CFT Hamiltonian is a member of this time band algebra, right? It's a single trace operator or the integral of a sing single trace operator. Uh, so it's a member of this algebra, okay? So this means that the operators that we need to construct, they have to commute with the Hamiltonian, okay? So why is that not so trivial? Let me just remind you how the HKLL con construction works. So HKLL. So the way we usually write down a bulk operator in ADS-CFT is the following. So it's a function of you know, bulk time, bulk radial direction, and then the angular directions on the sphere. And we get it by doing an integral transform of the associated single trace operator that is dual to it on the boundary, okay? And so the formula looks like this. Okay, so O is a single trace operator that's dual to the bulk field phi. Okay, and K, this is the bulk to boundary propagator. Uh, which you would get by solving the wave equation on the appropriate background that you're considering. Okay, um, and you have to integrate this over all boundary times and angular direction. Okay, so it's like a smearing of the CFT operator over all values of time and angular directions omega uh, with some kernel uh, that is given by the bulk to boundary propagator. Okay. Um, and this is the leading order ex expression and at, it gets corrected order by order in the one over n expansion and includes different types of operators that you put here. Okay. But in particular, one property of the HKLL operator is that if you go to order one over n, it does not commute with the CFT Hamiltonian. Okay, really, and really, it's an order one over n effect. Okay, and this is again the gravitational Gauss law. 
what we to, to get the HKLL operator, you need to you specify it through the boundary because you solve for the bulk to boundary propagator in a particular gauge that makes reference to the boundary, usually the Pfefferman Gram gauge. Okay. So secretly, the HKL operator is making use of the boundary. Uh, and th that is why it does not commute with the Hamiltonian. Uh, and it doesn't commute with the Hamiltonian, not to leading order, but only to order one over n. And that's because the mixing uh, of the different operators is a one over n effect. Okay. And th this is the same thing. This is exactly the same effect that we were seeing here. Okay. And remember, from the gravitational perspective, it was an order G Newton effect, uh, which maps here in ADS CFT to an order one over N effect. Okay. Um, so the HKLL operator does not, so, so, so phi HKLL uh, does not satisfy our properties. Does not satisfy our conditions. And it certainly satisfies condition two because it is the HKLL operator. So it acts like it at leading order at large n, but in particular, not condition one. It doesn't commute uh, with the Hamiltonian. Okay. So the question will be what other types of ways can we find an operator um, that commutes with all of the CFT single trace operators in this narrow time band? Okay. Good. So let me discuss the types of CFD states uh, for which our prescription will work. So we're going to consider a CFD state psi zero with the following two properties. The first property is that the expectation of value of the Hamiltonian is order n squared. Okay. This means the state has large energy. It doesn't need to be a black hole state, uh, but it's an energy with large en it's a state with large energy such that the back reaction is order one. Okay, so you can think about, I don't know, a solar system living inside of ADS or a supernova explosion happening inside of ADS. You know, it's some, some state where the gravitational back reaction is strong, um, but it doesn't have to be a black hole. Okay, it's just some state of large energy where where, where, we, where back reaction is present. So this does not account. So uh, a state that is not of this type is like exciting one of the perturbative fields that lives on top of the ADS geometry. You know, that type of excitation would be an order, you know, a order one over n squared back reaction, and then would have energy order one. Okay. So this is a strongly back reacted state. Uh, and we also are going to demand that the variance of the energy is order n squared. Okay. Uh, and this requirement is really that the state is macroscopically time dependent. Okay, so for example, if you have a solar system, you know, planets are rotating, so the state changes as a, as a function of time. A supernova explosion happens at some moment in time, so the state changes. Uh, and in the, the condition on the CFT is that the variance over energies is large, okay? So in, in general, any state in the CFT can be written as some superposition of energy eigenstates, okay? So the first condition, this says that most of the states that we have here are order, have energies of order n squared. And the second condition says that the spread of these energy eigenstates in energy is also large, also of order n squared, okay? That's not peak. It's not a single eigenstate. It's some spread, some sufficiently large spread of energy eigenstates, of sum of energy eigenstates. Okay. Uh, and now we're going to define H0, uh, which is what we call the quote subspace of psi zero. Uh, so it's it's the Hilbert space of acting with you know, a finite number of single trace operators on the state psi zero. So these are all single trace operators. So you can talk about the Hilbert space of states where you act with many single trace operators, okay, as much as you want, but a large number, but that does not scale with n. Uh, and you act with those operators onto psi zero and that defines some Hilbert space and we call that the code subspace of psi zero. Okay, so this is the code subspace. 
Uh, and we can define P0, a projector onto that code subspace. Okay, I will need these in a second. All right. Uh, now, ju just one comment about these states. So the way you should interpret states that have the following property is these are states that are dual to semi-classical geometries. Okay. There, you see that they're states of say n equals to four super Yang mills. Okay, in principle, they have a decomposition of this type where these are the energy eigenstates of n equals to four. Uh, but you should think about them as, as semi-classical states where uh, or, or really coherent states of the quantum gravity theory. Um, and we, we know of several examples of how to construct states of this type. So let me just list some examples. So one is states prepared by a Euclidean path integral with sources for single trace operator. So for example, you can do the Euclidean path integral on a hemisphere in a CFT. If you put no sources, this just prepares the vacuum. And now you can start putting sources for single trace operators on this hemisphere. And the sources need to turn off sufficiently fast as you approach the equator, okay? That now prepares an excited state in the same theory. Uh, and these states have large energy and large variance, okay? You can also consider boundary states. So if you take a boundary state B, and now just to regularize it, you do some amount of Euclidean time evolution, that's also a state of this type, okay? It also has large energy and large energy variance. Uh, and finally, uh, for example, in D equals to two, you can prepare states using the Euclidean path integral with topologies, with topology. So for example, if you do the Euclidean path integral over a surface that looks like this, it has some, some torus plus uh, a cylinder sticking out. This again, prepares a high energy state, um, which has large energy variance, okay? Uh, and there's many more examples that we can consider, but, but all of these states should be interpreted as semi-classical geometries, okay? And exactly which semi-classical geometry depends on, you know, which sources you turned on here or what geometry you picked for the, the modulus of this surface here. Okay, good. So these are the class of states that we'll consider uh, and, and they have an important property, and that's really going to be sort of the central thing that we're going to use in this talk, is that we define something called the return amplitude, R of T, which is the square of the overlap of the state uh, with time evolved version of the state. Okay, and the return amplitude behaves in the following way. It's e to the minus n squared times F of T, where F of T is positive, uh, and it's an order one function at order one times, okay? So what this tells you is that if you take your state psi zero um, and you look at the overlap between that state and the time evolved version of that state, the overlap decreases exponentially fast with a coefficient n squared, okay? So after an order one amount of time evolution, the overlap between these two states is exponentially small. Okay, and this is related to what I was talking about uh, earlier when, when answering the question about, uh, you know, get in the Bekenstein Hawking entropy, um, is that the way you can interpret this formula is that your state is, it's a coherent state and it's time dependent. So as you evolve it in time, you get a different state that is still a coherent state, but it's a different coherent state. And the overlap between two different coherent states is e to the minus one over h bar times some function, okay, that depends on the details. And here we're seeing that and, you know, n squared in gravity is playing the role of one over h bar, okay? So what this says is under time evolution, these states orthogonalize extremely quickly, okay? Can, uh, question. question. I was interpreting a uh, uh, smart way, and I can only use your confirmation or your comment. I was interpreting uh, as uh, imagine matter collapsing to a black hole of matter, 
and for example, still collapse. And so you have high energy still with the uh, with the infinite blue shift. You also have a high variance, and the state after you evolve would be the resulting state, and that would make another similarity to the fucking entropy. Could could you understand that? N not not fully. I'm sorry. <laughs> sort of half of the words. Can you can hear me? I was interpreting your state. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I hear you now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was in interpreting your state as, for example, the matter uh, collapsing into a black hole, like the, the final yes. stages. And uh, you have the high energy, the high variance, and this um, return function would just be uh, the the amount of the waves that would propagate after the collapse of the black hole. And so you have this. Uh, suppressing behavior. That's how, that's how I was interpreting. Uh, am I thinking about it correctly? Uh, no, no, you, you can. So, you know, for example, your state psi zero could be some matter distribution, some shell that eventually will form in, into a black hole. Yeah. Right? The, and so uh, if you look at the shell at one moment in time and then the shell at a later moment in time, they will be macroscopically different. You know, it'll, it'll yeah. have to collapse. Uh, and the point is that these two states in the full quantum theory, their overlap is very, very small. That's what this is saying. Because, and they, because they have to be related by Hawking radiation. No, no, this is not, sorry, this is not a quantum effect. This is a purely, so this is a purely classical thing. You know, we're just, this is not about the black hole evaporation. This is about taking a, a shell of matter mm -hmm. and letting it collapse and looking, you know, at, at a later time, it'll have partially collapsed. And at that state, you know, those two states are very different. So I don't know if you can see the, so, you know, so we, we can start, let's look at it this way. So uh -huh. he, here's T equals zero. Okay. Uh, and, and we start with a shell that's sort of spread out in, in a, you know, has a, has a large spatial extent. And then we let, we let this go gravitational collapse. So the shell will do something like this, you know. Um, okay, and at some later time, it's much denser. Yes. Right? So, so now we look at the state at this time, and you see it, it looks very different from the one before. It, it only has a matter concentrated very near the center. Okay. So, so this is this is psi of t equals zero, and this is psi of uh, I don't know t one. Let's call it. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is that the overlap of these two states, uh, goes like e to the minus n squared. It's a very, very small overlap. Yeah. Okay. I was and thinking, uh, looking at times very, very, very far away and, uh, yeah, so very good. So, yeah, yeah. So you can look also at very, very long time scales. That's actually, that's very interesting. There's a lot of cool physics there. As you say, eventually maybe a black hole will form. Then at later times, there's going to be even, you know, very interesting late time physics related to chaos. Uh, but for this talk, I will not do that. I'll just I'll just focus on order one time scales. Um, I, I'm not saying it's not interesting to look at long times. It's very interesting, but we're we're not going to need it for this talk. Okay. And Thanks. let me just plug in my laptop. Otherwise, it's gonna it's gonna turn off. That's another disadvantage of using the cable for the iPad is that it drains my laptop. Good. Uh, okay. So, so, so really, the way you should think about this is that two states that are semi that are you know macroscopically or classically different have an extremely small overlap. Okay. The fact that the overlap is not zero is why it's tricky to get the Bekenstein Hawking from this because you have many states that are almost orthogonal but they're not actually orthogonal, so it's hard to count them. Um, Okay, but we, we we won't need that. We won't need them to be actually orthogonal. This will be perfectly sufficient for us. Okay, and it's just important that after an order one time scale, they become basically orthogonal up to e to the minus n squared corrections. Okay. And everything I'm gonna say in, in what follows, and I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'll, I'll speed up a little bit, just follows from this property. Okay, and, and I should say at early at early time, Okay, at early time, oh, sorry. 
there's no n squared here. At early time, you can show that this function behaves as e to the minus t squared delta h squared. Okay, this you can just show. And you see that if delta h squared goes like n squared, you see that the early time behavior is e to the minus t squared n squared. Okay, so the fact that we demanded a large variance is, is because we wanted this return amplitude to decay very, very fast. And again, physically, this related, related to the fact that the state should be macroscopically time dependent. So as you evolve in time, you get a different coherent state, and those are, have a very small overlap. Okay, good. So now let me just write down the, the, the bulk local operators. So now we're going to define a phi hat. There's some normalization constant that I'll write down in a second. It's not ter terribly important. It's an integral Okay. And C is some normalization constant. I'll, I'll write, write it down for completeness, but it's not very important. Okay, so let me just say what the terms are here. So, so there's a constant, it's not very important. We take a time integral uh, with some, with some um, range by, given by some T star and T star not, is not very important. You can actually fix it to be whatever you want. We're just going to take it to be order one in the large n limit. You know, it could be pi or two or six. It doesn't matter. You make it what you want. Um, then there's these terms that are just the, the time evolution operator. Okay, H is the CFT Hamiltonian. P0 was the projector on the quote subspace of the state psi zero. Okay, so these, these operators, we're going, to, we're going to need to act with these operators on the state psi zero. And this is the projector onto the quote subspace. Phi is the HKL operator that I wrote down before. And that's it. That's every single turn in the sum. Okay. So the idea, the rough idea is that you take the HKL operator and you do some procedure to it. You integrate it uh, over time with the evolution operator and these projector operators. And my claim is that this operator phi hat satisfies the property that we wanted, that it commutes with the, the time bound algebra um, to all orders uh, in, in one over N. Uh, and that to leading order at large n, it acts just like the HKL operator. Okay. Uh, and the proof is so simple that I can do it in a few lines. So I just I, I just want to do it to convince you, and and then I'll I'll give two or three comments about interpretation, and then I'll finish. Okay. I'll, I need like five more minutes. Is that okay. Uh, just a quick question, Alex. Uh, yes, this yes. this phi operator, this bulk local operator that you that you have here, doesn't depend on time. No. Because no, the so HKLL, you, you integrated over the, the T prime, what you call T prime before, and now we are yeah, so, also integrating over time. So <laughs> you can see that if you act with this, so, so you start by, you know, picking a gauge, solving, you know, your supernova explosion in ADS, okay, and picking a bulk point that you like, uh, and then you write down the HKLL operator there, okay, so you've labeled the point that you like. The problem is that, you know, now, if you do time evolution on the CFT state, it's also going to lift up your operator. Okay, this operator here does not depend on time in that way. In that, if you act with it on the state psi zero, or if you act with it on the state psi of t, it'll always act at the same bulk point. It will not move because it commutes with the Hamiltonian. Okay, so in that sense, it does not depend on time. It always acts at the same point, even though you can time evolve your state. And 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 that's very different from what the HKLL operator. Would yeah okay yeah, thanks yeah good question yeah uh, okay so let me just show property one it, it, it's it's really very simple so we can look at the commutator uh, so the most worrisome operator is the hamiltonian because of the gravitational gauss law so let's check if the operator commutes with the hamiltonian okay so here's just a way to write the commutator okay and you take that and you take that expression and you plug it in here. Okay. And what you get is the following. Uh, these e to the is h terms, they'll just shift the time evolution here and there. 
which you can reabsorb into a, a, a change of the time variable. So this will just like, this will just shift time. Okay, and the whole thing evaluated at s equals to zero. Okay. Uh, but this is, you know, the derivative of an integral with respect to the endpoint. So by the fundamental theorem of what I uh, analysis or whatever, uh, this is just the value of the function at the endpoint, right? So so this thing is just equal. So the commutator of h phi is just equal to minus i c p of t star phi of t star. Or this is the 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 operate the HKL operator conju conjugated with the time evolution operator uh, minus the other endpoint. Okay, but imagine now you insert this commutator of h and phi into the state psi zero. Okay. Uh, now you're going to have here. Uh, this is gonna basically look up to some operators like the trace of P zero and P of T star, okay? Or, or you know, you can rewrite this as Psi zero, Psi of T star, Psi of T star, Psi zero, okay? But these overlaps here from what I said before, they go like E to the minus N squared times some function F of T star, which was order one, okay? So because you have a, a projector onto a later time here, uh, onto the state at a later time, uh, you're gonna get a contribution here to the commutator that only comes from the endpoints and that is exponentially small in N squared, okay? So the way that you should interpret this is that the operator phi hat commutes with H to all orders in the one over N expansion, okay? So this equals zero to all orders in one over N. Okay, and you see it just follows from uh, two lines, okay? And property two is just as simple. So now we can compute psi zero. We put a bunch of correlators, we put our operator phi hat, sorry, we put a bunch of single trace operators, okay? Uh, and we try to eval evaluate this. So this will just be given by, So there's this time integral that appears in, in, in the operator, psi zero, there's the O's, there's the e to the i, uh, e to the i t h, t zero, phi, t zero, e to the i minus i t h. Then there's a bunch of O's and there's the state psi zero. Uh, and again, this is an integral over time, but every time uh, for, for all times where T is not zero, you're gonna have here a projector PT uh, and here a projector P zero. So this integral over time is gonna be dominated by a saddle point where T equals to zero. So to leading order in the saddle point approximation, this is gonna be equal to psi zero, a bunch of O's. It's just the value of the, of the, of the integral at T equals to zero. Phi O psi zero, okay? plus order one over n corrections that come from going beyond the saddle point uh, evaluation of that integral, okay? So what this says is that to leading order at large n, this correlation function equals to the correlation function uh, where the operator is replaced by the HKLL operator, okay? So in other words, to leading order at large n, it acts exactly like the HKLL operator that we had before, but it has that enhanced property that it commutes with the Hamiltonian which the HKL operator did not. And it commutes with the Hamiltonian to all orders in one of them, okay? So let me just finish with some interpretation comments. Um, and, 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 and then I'll be done, okay? So the idea is that the HKL operator was dressed to the boundary. That's how it was constructed. Our new operator phi hat is dressed to the state. Okay, so let me draw a picture. 
So imagine you have some time dependent state, say, I don't know, a supernova explosion in ADS, okay? There's some infalling star, it explodes to a supernova and shoots out, okay? We started with an HKL operator that was here and it was the standard HKL operator. So it's dressing with respect to the boundary, okay? That's phi. What we did is we applied some transformation to it, to some other operator phi hat. And the dressing of phi hat is not to the state, but it's to the supernova explosion, okay? It says act five meters right of the supernova explosion, okay? So now you see that if you translate your state in time, the red operator, so now let's translate our, our state in time, the red operator will still act here, but the blue operator does not make use of the boundary. It's dressed with respect to the state and it always knows how to act five meters right of the supernova. So in that sense, it acts always in the same bulk location, no matter if you act on it, if you act with it on psi zero or on psi of t. Okay. Um, and for our prescription to work, it was very important, and I, I, I should have said this, that, but that the state breaks the symmetry. I said that it was important that our state is time dependent. If you do this on the vacuum, the state preserve, is preserved by the symmetry. So, so psi zero, psi of t does not decay. It's just constant, okay? So if the state preserves the symmetry, you cannot do this. And it's because there's no special point in the bulk to which you can refer to. But here we have a state that breaks the symmetry. There's one moment in time where a supernova explosion goes off and we're dressing our local bulk operator to that state. Okay, and just like we had in this Kerr example where we could rearrange the degrees of freedom, the idea is that here, how come when you act with this operator, you don't increase the energy at the boundary? This happens because really what our operator is doing is borrowing a little bit of energy from the supernova. You could have a supernova of mass M and say, you know, replace it by a supernova of mass M minus epsilon plus one operator of energy epsilon. And together, these two things still have total mass M. Okay, so this is this is the interpretation uh, of the state, um, and and okay, so so just some some final comments. Okay, so it doesn't work in the vacuum. So in this sense, we're not um, contradicting the results of of Surat and collaborators. Okay. And it's for a very special reason is that the state, the, the vacuum state does not break symmetries. And so it's, it's return amplitude does not decay exponentially fast. Okay. Um, there's some other interesting examples. If you take a micro canonical state, so that's like sum over I, C, I, E, I, where all the E's are within an order one micro canonical window with small variance. Uh, sorry, you, you can make the variance large as well. So you can sample over these with delta H squared is of order N squared um, with typical choices for these coefficients CI. Uh, such a state is dual to a black hole, okay? Outside the horizon, there's no, there's no feature. And from what we understand, there's no feature inside the horizon either. Uh, but because the state has a large variance, we can still formally um, use our prescription. So the question is, where does the dressing go for such a state? And the answer is, we don't really know. I think this is this would be a case where the dressing is sort of microscopic, okay? Uh, and a final comment, and then I'll stop, is that um, all, all of this formalism also works in the case where you have an, an evaporating black hole, like has been discussed on the recent progress on the information paradox. And there's also been concerns about those stories that if you have an island that forms inside the the black hole horizon that is encoded in the radiation, how is that consistent with the gravitational Gauss law? And our story, I think, indicates that uh, there's no problem with that, is that the dressing just goes to the state itself, okay? And as long as the variance is large, you can do this. All right, anyway, I've gone over time. Sorry about that. So let me let me stop here and thank you for your attention. Okay. So any questions? Uh, are there any questions? Yes, I could drop. How does one probe locality then in your quantum zero of gravity? If you imagine other 
possible uh, the theories of gravity, others one probable causality from just constructing these operators. Ah, good. I should have said that. So once you have the operator phi hat, okay, uh, what you can do this this operator is for permission. So you can act with e to the i phi hat, okay, on your state psi. Um, and now the point is that if you start computing, so let, let's call this psi prime, okay? Uh, so now if you start computing single trace correlators, those will be equal because of the commutation property to uh, single trace correlators in the state psi, okay, up to, order e to the minus m squared. Uh, so what this shows is that you can localize information just like in quantum field theory here. Namely, if you just compute single trace correlators uh, located in the time bands, you will not be able to tell whether you're in the state psi or in the state psi prime, okay? So it's possible to act with, uh, with, uh, with operators uh, that completely hide the information from you, okay? So in this sense, it's, it's, it's like quantum field theory. There's a difference is that in quantum field theory, it's exact. Here, it's up to e to the minus n squared corrections. Okay, so, so if you want, this shows that locality is preserved in the sense that um, you can hide information from the boundaries. And you can do that to all orders in one over n perturbation theory. So does that answer the question? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Square. Well, any any questions? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. But here it, it, there is a slight difference between this and the classical gravity case, right? This this phi operator doesn't depend. You don't have to think of him like living in some space like separated. Okay, you are already imposing that the yes. this phi uh, with a hat commutes with single trace. So I guess it's. Yeah, so yeah. the idea is that it's it, it is it is a space like separated operator. Yeah, the, the yeah right. Field theory. Yes. Sorry, sorry there, there was another. Uh, no, no, no. I under yeah, I understand. No. Yes. Well, if there are no more questions, then let's thank Alex again. Thanks. And we can add here. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you.